so again, we were talking about um, uh, uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and you know, a lot of us kind of over the years, lapatinib has kind of been somewhat disappointing to some of us. Um, and now along comes a, a variety of tyrosine kinase inhibitors, in particular neratinib, uh, which a lot of us for a long time thought was equivalent to um, uh, lapatinib, except more diarrhea. Uh, but I think there's been a lot of very uh, exciting and interesting studies uh, that have come up over the last few years. One of them is a Nefertiti trial. Could you explain that to us? Anon? Yeah, sure. I think before to go to this trial, I would like to put uh, the study in the context of sure. neratinib uh, program. Yeah. You know, a single agent therapy in trastuzumab naive patient, this drug gave up to 45% objective response rate. Right. In patient pre-treated with trastuzumab, up to 25% objective response rate. And there are many combinations, including the combination of weekly paclitaxel plus neratinib, which was compared to weekly paclitaxel plus trastuzumab in the NFRT trial. And so this trial shows exactly that the both arm are superposable in terms of production free survival uh, and as well uh, objective response rate. But what's really interesting in this trial uh, because it was planned to look to the CNS event in each arm uh, uh, during the trial. And what we showed that in the weekly paclitaxel arm plus trastuzumab, we have 40 event. In the weekly paclitaxel plus neratinib arm, we have uh, 20 event. That means the incidence of CNS event was reduced by 50%. And that's really a very important information knowing the bulk of uh, this problem in HER2 disease. I mean by that brain met CNS event. Right. And it so is on. The, I think it is the major issue, one of the and major so issues. And really, it's really important uh, to look, to go back to this and to try to really to show the importance of this drug in preventing and or delaying the appearance of CNS event in the evolution of HER2, negative, HER2 positive disease. Right, I mean, I'm very excited by this. I mean, even though trastuzumab, uh, taxane by themselves is double, it is not standard of care anymore, um, the fact that this had equivalent response, that lopatinib, neratinib and uh, taxane had an equivalent response, has never really been seen. I mean, you know all the data from lopatinib with MA31, you know, showing inferiority, the second line trials having to be stopped with lapatinib because of inferiority of systemic disease. And you have that as well as the decrease in brain meds in a randomized first line trial, I think is actually fairly uh, interesting. And, yeah. you know. Very quick remark about, about the CNS event because CNS, brain met meningitis and so on. I think it's really important when we uh, to look to drugs which not, will be difficult to, to discover drugs which uh, shrink let's say brain met heavily pretreated right. by systemic disease as well by local therapy. But I think it's really important to look for drugs which could prevent or delay right. uh, the appearance of this. And from our study, this could be the case, could be happening with uh, neratinib. And so it's important to confirm that. And we have in our uh, program a study looking to, to at least we are looking to, to this uh, important, uh, let's say, endpoint, right. delaying or preventing the appearance of CNS event. So Hope, this drug was kind of developed though opposite. So you know, the first actually indication for approval is going to be actually, it looks like in the adjuvant setting, kind of the post trastuzumab adjuvant setting. Can you talk about Extinet? Yeah, I mean, it's such an interesting sort of uh, progression. Usually what happens is we get really excited about something and then our excitement wanes over time, right? Uh, and you know, you could even go back to bone marrow transplant for breast cancer. I mean, uh, this is exactly the opposite where the initial uh, data from neuronib seemed like it was a really toxic drug, caused a lot of diarrhea and, you know, me too to lapatinib. And so we weren't all that excited. Then we saw the data from the TEACH trial that suggested that when you added lapatinib in the adjuvant setting in patients who are farther out from their HER2 positive early stage diagnosis that you didn't really benefit patients. So toxicity without much benefit. Neratinib, however, has this intriguing data and I actually become extremely interested in it. And it's, as I say, this sort of from not too excited to very excited. Uh, the neratinib is a potent irreversible pan-HER inhibitor that inhibits HER2, HER1, EGFR, and HER4. And in the Extinet trial, it would, the idea originally was very much like TEACH, which was to add it on after somebody had completed a year of adjuvant trastuzumab. 
for one more year. Now remember when that study was developed, we didn't know the results of HERA, which showed that the continued trastuzumab didn't uh, benefit patients as a whole, uh, but we did over time know the results of TEACH. So what happened was you got some negative data from the metastatic setting because of toxicity, I presume, and maybe designs which weren't perfect, uh, and dosing and toxicity management which was delayed. So the drug was sort of shuffled along from one company to another to now its current owner, Puma. And so what ended up happening over the course of Extinet was, first what happened was they reduced the number of patients, saying, okay, we're gonna cut our losses. And then, the, very clever, and this was, I think, a critical move, the idea was to uh, expand the population of patients so that you increased the risk of relapse. So you took patients who had higher risk disease, bigger tumors, positive nodes, residual disease after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. That was really important. And then they changed the endpoint to a clinically important endpoint, which was inv invasive disease-free survival, as opposed to just looking at any event. You know, MA17R, you reduce contralateral new breast cancers, but that may not be a reason to extend your uh, adjuvant hormone therapy. So that was really important. And then when Puma picked it up and saw the positive results from the uh, neoadjuvant iSpy trial published this year in the New England Journal, showing that if you looked at uh, kind of a similar design to NFRT, which was uh, looking at neratinib and paclitaxel versus trastuzumab and paclitaxel and showed that the, uh, the uh, estimated or uh, potential PCR rates were higher in the neratinib uh, arm, uh, that uh, I think led to wanting to follow these patients longer. So they changed the follow-up from two years to five years. So what results did we get? So the initial data, if you just think about three-year invasive disease-free survival, the first data that came out said, oh, there's you know, a little more than a 2% difference in invasive disease-free survival. We're like, oh, you know, almost 100% diarrhea rate at 30% grade three, or more, and mostly it's grade three and uh, only two and a half percent, is it worth it, right? So then you look at the pre-planned subset analysis at ER positive disease, and if you, you see that it, you can then double that number, it's over 4% in patients who had ER positive disease. Then they went back and looked at patients who had centrally confirmed HER2 positive, which is really important, ER positive disease. And particularly if you look at the patients who are treated within a year of finishing their adjuvant trastuzumab, you can see more than a 7% improvement in disease-free survival in ER-positive disease, invasive disease-free survival. And that's better than we see with adjuvant chemotherapy. So that's actually quite impressive. And actually, the FDA asked them to uh, do an interim five-year analysis, although they don't have the number of events for the final analysis. And that's public, and it shows, again, a 7% improvement in ER-positive disease, centrally confirmed HER2, uh, with uh, in this interim five-year invasive disease-free survival analysis. Now, you know, you could still say, well, you know, what's your quality of life in that setting? But it turns out that you can reduce grade three uh, plus diarrhea to about 17% with intensive prophylaxis with loperamide. And the control trial is now looking at patients similar to Extinet and looking at a number of approaches, not just the loperamide, but figuring that if you take loperamide, patients don't like it much, they get diarrhea alternating with constipation, but also looking at an oral uh, non-absorbable steroid and some other approaches. We at UCSF, my colleague Joe Chen is looking at an herbal uh, agent that reduces secretory diarrhea since this is secretory. And then I think the last thing about this that's interesting um, about toxicity is that the toxicity is all up front, which is pretty helpful. It's not like you know seeing neuropathy that gets worse and worse over time. You get it right up front in the first few days. And once you've gotten past a month, your chances of getting significant diarrhea go way, way down. So it's something that patients can learn how to manage. And it would be very exciting if long-term we see less ever CNS metastases in these patients right. too. So to me, it's a real advance and exciting.